much for for having me here. Um, it's yeah, all of today has been a topic that I'm so passionate about and I've been working, you know, in this area for quite a while. So um, yeah, it's been really great to be invited and I've got lots of things to say. So hopefully I'll not talk too fast, like my mum always says I do, I do and, and fit it all in. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people, if I've pronounced that yeah, decently. Um, Ruby's has operated for nearly 30 years on Ghana land, which is um, the Adelaide Plains. Um, and about 10 years ago, we also opened a house on Bowendick land, which is Mount Gambia, sort of halfway between Mount Gambia, uh, Melbourne and Adelaide. So we're very, you know, we want to acknowledge that we're very privileged to work um, on those lands. Um, I think for me, I'll, I'm going to start with my dream, and I, I know it's the end of the day too, so I'll try and be um, somewhat energetic so people um, can, um, you know, not too tired of being being talked at. But for me, um, my dream, and I reckon some people in, in the room might share it, is that um, every young person um, in Australia, I'm dreaming big, in Australia will get a thorough and intensive and positive um, assessment and family support service before they get approved for Centrelink Unreasonable to Live at Home Youth Allowance or Independent Youth Allowance. Um, I, I'm, I dream this because uh, about 20 years ago I started out my career by working in the youth homelessness sector um, and just watching trends and things that have changed and everything over the last 20 years. You know, I'm, I'm starting to be really brave and say, I think we're really facilitating um, youth homelessness for a lot of young people, um, unfortunately, in this country. Um, the unreasonable live at home youth allowance, independent youth allowance um, and a youth homelessness sector really should exist for those young people for whom it is unsafe to live at home. Um, and there's a lot of young people for whom it's not unsafe to live at home, um, but they end up not living at home. And there's so many ramifications in their life because of that. Um, but um, I wasn't going to... Um, so that's that's why Ruby's exists, because of all of that. I'm not going to focus on that because I kind of figure that people in this room might agree with that. Um, but today I really wanted to talk about what is Ruby's, um, try and explain what it is. It's a few different things. Um, but um, yeah, and really share the knowledge, I guess, after running the program for nearly 30 years. Um, we've had lots of successes, lots of challenges and doing things the wrong way and we've learnt from them. Um, and yeah, in particular, um, about two years ago, we started talking to some people or a range of people in the ACT um, and then the ACT government tended for rubies. Um, and a couple of months ago, the program started in the ACT. So we're not providing it as United Communities. We run the service in South Australia and have done for 29 years. But a new, a new agency is running it in Canberra. So um, largely my role has been to really focus on what is rubies and trying to sort of look at how we capture that and how we share it with someone else so that they can um, they can run rubies. Um, so at its very heart, if I, here we go. Um, at its very heart, or the, at the most basic level, um, Ruby's is about preventing youth homelessness. Um, and it's, it's two things, two simple things, family counselling um, and a safe place to stay. So very much the, from today's first and third presentation, um, you know, there's so much of what um, both those presenters said that I'm like, we, that's exactly what we do and that's exactly what we do and that's exactly what we do. And sometimes using different language um, so, yeah, it's great to hear that other people, you know, doing the same things and, and we know it works, so I'm glad to hear it's happening elsewhere. Um, but the thing that's different for Ruby's, and we know we're really lucky, is, is the safe place to stay. So we literally have um, four houses where we run Ruby's. Um, and I thought, you know, I like including some photos to give you a bit of a, a give people a vibe, you know, a sense of what it sort of looks like. Um, so, yeah, we get to do family counselling and, and work with families. Um, but we get to do it based at residential properties. So we've got four houses. Top left is our one in Feverden, which is the inner west of Adelaide. The um, middle one's Mount Gambia. And they're just like any other house, you know, on, on the street. Um, and it just gives us the opportunity to do so much more than you can do in a traditional office-based environment or in an outreach capacity. Um, and it, just gives you the capacity to work so intensively and, and form intense, much more intensive relationships with families, I, I think, than you can do an office environment, as well as the really obvious one, which it gives the family time apart um, from each other, which when there's lots of conflict, a little bit of time to breathe um, is often a really, really good thing. Um, 
we don't we try not to use the word respite and sometimes the language is really important or language is always really important sometimes how we talk about the accommodation component is really important we don't want it to be like removing the problem removing the young person you, you can't be at home all that sort of things so there's lots of stuff around that that's really important um yeah but it's such a, a valuable um part the other um yeah so over the last 10 years or so that I've been working with Rubies, I've done a lot of thinking to try and work out what is Rubies, apart from like a house. Um, and I've, took me a while, I, I came up with these three things as the things that are really different about Rubies, I think that are really different about Rubies um, and that make it, make it successful. Um, the first one is we, we start with the assumption that the young person can go home until there's evidence that they can't. Um, and sometimes, because I've been working at Ruby's for so long, I think I forget how fundamentally different this is to a lot of other um, way that a lot of other people work. Um, the really important bit with this, or the reason, again, going back to why we're so lucky to have that residential component, co residential component, um, is because if there's any allegations, if there's any concern that the young person's not safe, we can house them. We can keep them at Ruby. So um, certainly that assumption doesn't mean, you know, we just leave them in the house and we let them get on with that until there's evidence, then we'll work with them. It's not at all that. We'll engage with all, you know, any family um, that, that wants the service. Um, but we don't assume um, that, um, yeah, that the young person can't go home um, until we've had whole bunch of conversations. Generally, we've worked with the family for months. The young person stayed with us um, on, on and off or permanently during that time because of allegations of being unsafe. So it's a really, um, a, a really important one for, um, for us and a really challenging one. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about safety in a second because so often when I'm talking to people from the youth sector um, or that work with young people in particular, that's you know, their, their biggest concern, just justifiably, and it should be. Um, but yeah, so I, I really acknowledge that because of that, that house, um, we've got a, a great advantage in keeping young people safe while we do the work that we're talking about. Um, the second is the safe accommodation option, um, as I mentioned. And the third one is our staff's values and relationships. So um, I guess for me, and like most people who are managers or leaders um, in this sector, I just think you know, it's the people that we have on the ground that do the work that is, that is rubies. It's the people by, you know, by far. So having people with the right values, um, their relationships with each other as they work together in the house in this home-like environment, um, that bit is so important to get right and that, that culture. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in that I've tried to pull out. What is that when we do get it right? Um, fairly briefly, the staffing structure, because that's really important to sort of understand what Ruby's is. Um, we pretty much have two full-time people that work pretty much nine to five, Monday to Friday, um, the coordinator and the counsellor. The coordinator, I describe their role as being the case manager for, for families, doing lots of the case management and the overseeing and coordination type stuff. They're also the line manager for the youth workers. Um, and they also have like an admin, you know, I think like a management admin, site management component. There's lots of and many bits to their role. You know, they have to do rostering and work health safety checks and all that kind of stuff. So their, their role kind of has three components. It's a really busy, busy role. Um, and there's a counsellor. So someone trained in family therapy um, who does the counselling with the families. But really importantly, they're based at the house and they're absolutely part of the team. Um, there's, having worked at Ruby's for a while now, I, I, I say, um, with respect that not every counsellor can be a Ruby's counsellor because it's a really, um, while counselling can be a very um, solo gig at times and some people work quite solo, some, some do great co-work, um, being part of a Ruby's team is a very different experience for a, uh, a counsellor. Your work gets completely, you know, torn apart and um, investigated by, by the whole team um, and you have to do a lot of work in um, building the strategies um, for, for the whole team. We talk about them as the therapeutic lead often, um, but the youth workers are the ones that have by far the majority of contact with young people and families. So actually it's about equipping them, it's about listening to them about what they're seeing, what they're worried about, all that kind of thing. Um, really quickly, because I think it helps describe what Ruby's is, um, this is a diagram that I use to explain like the different sort of, you know, young people that we, that we see. Um, and on a spectrum so that, that moves to the right without 
without great intervention. So um, lots of families luckily um, have just what I call a normal, normal adolescent conflict um, where there's always you know, this conflict and that's normal and, and they're able to get through it with different supports and networks. Um, but some families get to the point where the young person's living at home and the conflict gets pretty extreme. Um, and then if, without intervention, often they make a tentative break, you know, they're in and out of home in that kind of stage that we all know about. And then, you know, even worse is when they make that permanent break, often the youth shelter, the myth of independence. Um, I love that Nella's um, term. Um, yeah, and the Centrelink assessment, as, as you would know, kind of fits in there. So um, for Rubies, we internally we, we talk about different types of um, clients because it helps our staff get their heads around the, the different roles. Um, so reunification clients are really the clients that generally sit in that on the left hand side there. Um, they're generally still at home, some if not all the time. Um, and it means that the part-time accommodation and the program at Ruby's can be somewhat planned. We can speak to them before they come and stay with us. We can speak to the family, etc. cetera. Um, but we engage and support all family members in family counselling and practical supports. Um, and it's really more about building on the desire to remain living together. Um, further, further along, I guess, the, the spectrum, um, we, this is something we only developed in the last sort of 10 years when um, I think I think families have been, in my opinion, got more complex, um, and people don't reach out for support as early as they used to. Things get to crisis point and breaking point a lot more before they're talking to services. So, um, what we what we started doing literally was accepting clients on on what we call an emergency accommodation need. So that means the young person needs somewhere to stay tonight. So the young person's rocked up somewhere any range of services or schools or whatever and gone, yep, can't go home. Um, and so rather than putting them in a, in a youth shelter, youth refuge, um, where they're going to be with other young people who are independent on Centrelink, on that process, etc., cetera, um, we say, come and stay with us. Um, and then we'll engage all the family members and we'll conduct, conduct a ongoing assessment for reunification. I like that term. It basically means we'll work with them for a period of time to work out whether or not they should even be going home. Because at that stage, as you can imagine, there's lots of information from lots of different people. There might be a parent saying, no, F and way, is that person coming, you know, is that kid coming back over my dead body or the, or the opposite. You know, we ring them up and they're, oh, thank Christ, the per you know, my, my child's actually alive. I haven't heard from them in, you know, X numbers of, of days or hours. Um, yeah, and so it's all, you know, all kinds of um, situations there, but it is about um, slowly, often very slowly, engaging all family members and going, hey, can we talk about, um, can we talk about what's going on? How can we support you? All those counsellor questions from the last presentation, what, how could it look different, etc. So there's a real, um, real focus for me in that one about challenging people that want to give up and creating hope that reunification is possible. Twelve to seventeen. Sorry. Um, there can be child. Obviously, not. We we're homelessness funded, so we can't work with anyone who's under guardianship who's been removed and is on an order, um, because we're funded by the homelessness sector. Um, but yeah, but certainly most families that we see have had some involvement with child protection in some capacity. We get referrals from child protection, certainly, etc. Yeah. Sorry. Um, do ask if there's bits I leave out. I'm really happy to have questions because there's lots of bits and I, I forget what, you know, I've worked here so long, I forget what all the assumptions that I make. So if there's bits of the puzzle that, that don't make sense, please, please ask. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so in, in this one too, I think it's really about some time to create the hope that reunif reunification is possible, um, that living together is possible. Um, and obviously, like we've talked about today, even about that hope that even if reunification and going home is not possible, then some sort of relationship um, is possible. You know, it might be that we can we can have Sunday dinner together still or we'll see each other at Christmas or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, we the, in in the last section we don't really work with the last section in particular. Certainly, our, our focus and our aim is people is young people before that in, that um, that Centrelink income is granted, um, because for me it, it's such a marker as people would know when when young people get an income, lots of things change for them, um, and and financially and, um, and and somewhat legally it can change for their, the parents and their responsibilities. 
Um, I included some client quotes just because, um, and these are on videos that are actually on the website, just because I like including the client voice so much. And because for these, these two for me are really powerful. Um, so one of the parents um, said there were days where I really wanted to give up and Ruby's helped me not to do that. I think the reason I'm still in contact with my son now is because I was able to not give up because of the support and strength that they gave me here at Ruby's. So just like the last presentation and the one this morning, it's just about creating some hope. Um, this is a mum whose son had some really significant mental health issues. So we ended up not support, you know, supporting the young person not to return home, um, which absolutely happens in sort of 15 to 20% of the families that we work with. Um, yeah, but, but maintaining that relationship is obviously really important for her wellbeing and for her son's wellbeing, who was, I think he was about 17 when he left us. So um, needed a lot of supports in his life. Um, and Lily's a young person who's been, who had a couple of years interaction with the program, um, also actually didn't go home. Um, but I think, you know, her, her line in the, in the video, she says, if it wasn't for a reason, I'd probably be dead. For me, that's really powerful. And it's, you know, the work that all of you guys do, I'm quite sure on a, on a daily basis, it's about, um, you know, creating options um, and, and hope for, for a better future than, than what people are currently going through when they see us. So, hang on, Ooh, why is that? There we go. So, um, that's, that's the kind of what is Ruby's, the brief overview. And for the rest of the presentation, um, the plan was to focus, oh, hang on, I went too far, on, on the model. Um, and that's the kind of how we describe what we do and what we think the interactions are with families that, that work um, and the non-negotiables for staff and what we think, you know, how we think how we think about families and children and safety and all that stuff. So um, hopefully that's really useful um, to you guys. Knowing that you're not in a Ruby's house, some of these things are gonna be really hard to, to do, but some of them wouldn't be. Some of them you'll already be doing, um, and it might just be about different language or a different way of putting it. You go, oh, that's what I do, um, and that works really well. Um, but also hopefully if you're not doing this stuff, it can give you some ideas about the ways to just increase the, the family work, etc. Um, this one's also on the website. Um, um, it's a bunch of resources and videos and stuff. There's a video walking through one of the houses on the video on the website too that, that people quite like. Um, so basically, we um, for a program that's been around for 30 years, um, what I found 10 years ago when I started was we don't have a lot written down. And it was lots of like urban myth and this is what we do around here and this is you know all this language and stuff that, that people accepted. But it meant lots of service drift at times and people doing things and interpreting things their own way. Um, and as a manager, you know, there's been a few scary moments when you kind of go, what? You're doing what? Um, so, um, so about six years ago, we wrote a very slim service model and then um, about a year, a year and a half ago when um, Canberra was looking like happening, we spent a lot of time going, what is this thing called Rubies? What is it that we do? And obviously, you know, apart from having a house, it's, it's absolutely about what we do and, and how we think about it. Um, so, um, so there's three components, as you can, you can tell. Um, the essential theories around the outside, so family therapy, attachment theory, trauma-informed service delivery, strengths-based approach, adolescent development and narrative therapy. Um, I, I won't talk about them because they're all things that you can go and, and learn about um, and or would know about in different ways. Um, but we put them there because we think um, it's essential that everyone in the, the team um, knows about all of those theories and has a, has a basic understanding. So it might just be a, a, a small amount of knowledge in those, depending on their role, or it might be quite a lot of quite a lot of knowledge, but those things absolutely underpin um, how we think about um, all our work. Um, the essential principles, um, we are, are basically, as, as it says, these are the, the complete non-negotiables. Um, I love having a few non-negotiables in life when life's so black and white, and I'd say everything at, at Ruby's actually is really grey, um, and there's, there's very few non-negotiables, but these are the, the non-negotiables. Um, and the, yeah, they're like guiding statements. So for me, they should direct all the decisions and the actions. Um, and the youth workers in particular, because they're, they, a lot of their work is done after hours. So they're making a whole bunch of decisions on the fly when other people aren't around, etc. So 
for me, certainly it's about, hey, if you're, if you're making decisions based on these things, then you're making the right decisions or you're, you're the best that you can at the time. Um, so no matter what happens and no matter what critical incident occurs, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we trust that you're doing your best um, and we'll talk about, you know, we'll work with whatever the consequences are. Um, they're also, yeah, all really, we're well, trying to get them into really simple statements, um, but they actually encompass quite a lot. Um, so I thought I'd go through them um, and explain what, what we mean by them. We've, worked, we've played with the language a bit over time. So, um, yeah, so sometimes it's, um, yeah, just to make sure I guess that it's, it's clear. Um, I think actually when I was looking at these last night, just reviewing them, the other thing that um, made me smile anyway was that um, as, as a manager was I realised that um, in a way you could most most of these are quite reactionary in that they've been written when things went you know pear shaped or, or south or we realised that one of the teams wasn't practicing in the way we wanted to go and so it you know helped us really clarify no that's that's complete service drift and actually this is what we do and this is the non-negotiable um, yeah so these are the things I'm I'm really clear on and it's really great when you hear stuff um, and and youth workers um, parroting them back because um, you know they get it. Um, so prioritise safety and wellbeing. So the most important over everything, you know, probably don't have to talk about that in this room, is, is safety. And that's safety for everyone. So that includes staff, which is a really important one sometimes when you've got a, a residential 24-7 service. The number of times I've spoken to staff who didn't think that their safety was important, it's kind of scary. Um, actually, they put themselves in, in situations that might no, you don't have. You shouldn't have had to do that. You didn't you know, need to do that. But um, yeah. But but most importantly, really, or, or first, we talk about safety, obviously from the young person's perspective and from all young person's perspectives, because there are other young people impacted by the the core client, if you will, um, mostly being siblings, usually. Um, so and as you guys, you know, so so for us, it's prioritising the safety and well-being of all people, all members of the family in particular. But um, you know the standard lines that you guys will be familiar with, particularly about young people being prioritised, um, even with, with, within that, um, based on their their lack of power, their developmental stage, being more vulnerable in our communities, etc. So there's a absolutely a, a child focused um, component in that. Um, the second one, value living with families, sorry, value living with family, um, comes from that assumption about um, about that well, comes from the, the assumption and, and something that's been mentioned today about the fact that most people, um, the vast majority of people that we meet actually want to live with their families, um, certainly if that, when that's developmentally appropriate, the children, children and young people, um, and they love their families and they want a connection with their families. Um, so, yeah, so that one's really about prioritising family relationships, even when it gets hard, even when it gets tough, etc. cetera. Um, the next one, work with all family members. That's probably the most straightforward in the sense that we will engage with whoever the young person identifies as, as family. Um, but a really important one to, to you know continue with Ruby's, um, even at Ruby's there's been times when we've got really youth centric to the exclusion of, of family um, with, with a bit of service drift. So this is, you know, it's very much um, reminding people that this is a family program. Um, engage with family complexities. Um, I smile because this one for me is the one that says that's when when um, staff don't want to work with a family because it's too hard because there's something going on that's that's scary or um, or whatever. So for me, this one is about remembering that the families that come to the service will have complexities in their lives. They wouldn't be at the service if there weren't challenging behaviours or some scary stuff going on or some you know um, violence like we've spoken about today and a whole lot of shouting matches usually. Um, so this one is, is largely for staff to say, you know, you need to expect that and actually we don't run away from that, but we actually work with, that's what we work with, that's, you know, why they're here. Um, support respectful, trusting and open communication. Um, that one's gone through a different couple of iterations in its life, but basically that one, that's about defining the fact that we um, support relationships that are safe and healthy. Um, and identifying that um, if a relationship isn't respectful, trusting and open, um, then it's likely not a healthy relationship um, and not a relationship that we, we would support. Um, and then um, develop families, networks and connections. Um, 
that one is is around as again we've mentioned a number of times today the fact that families um, individuals and families need a whole bunch of connections um, in their lives to, to thrive and that looks different for everyone but often when families come to us they are they're quite isolated um, based on all the, the stress and the tension that they've been, been going through um, yeah in the last you know year, years and months um, so I'm going to be annoying actually because I forgot to check the time. Can I just get a time check from someone roughly? So I've been talking for a half now. Is that right? Okay, cool. Okay, um, that's good. I, I'll, I'll slow down slightly. Um, this is a terrible slide, so you can tell that I cut and pasted it. Um, but these are the, the key practices. So um, for me, when we looked at... Um, before we looked at Canberra, we had the other two. We knew about the theories that we all worked with. We knew about these principles. They were written out in really long language, but we knew there were these non-negotiables. Um, and there was all this stuff that we seemed to do at, at Ruby's houses. Um, and it was really hard to, to think about, well, what has to happen to, to make it a Ruby's house? So if someone else um, in, in Canberra, if a new agency in Canberra is running the service, like if, if they're gonna put the Ruby's name on it, what do they need to do? Um, and, and, and some of them would be less obvious than others. So for, we came up with these three, um, three sections with different um, things, things that people do, and largely the youth workers, um, because they are the, the absolute face and the, the heart of the service. Um, so under safety and reunification, um, the first one is prioritise safety. So that all, again, you know, it's, it's a no brainer really. It always comes first um, before everything safety um safety and well-being and child focused child first um the second one um require consent is um a little bit well is, is an interesting one to describe so basically require consent is about um the fact that the young people we work with um have different depending on their ages different um obligations and their, and their parents have different rights and responsibilities about the information um, about their child, so um, it's it's a challenging environment sometimes to to negotiate, and certainly when people are, are scared about sharing information within a family. Um, but certainly for young people under sixteen, we're really clear that if the parent says, "My child can't stay at Ruby's," I will not allow that. Then we can't accommodate the child. So that's a legal thing. Often that would also mean we're putting in a notification to our child protection system, um, because if they're saying, you know, why are they saying that they can't can't stay with you? Um, and you know, in that situation, often the usually it's the young person who is requesting um, somewhere safe to stay. So obviously there's all kinds of alarm bells um, going off with that one. Um, but there's all there's lots of different layers lay in that as well. Um, we certainly within within Ruby's and within the team, we talk about sharing all the information about a family. So um, we, you know, if, if a mum says, I'm gonna tell you, you know, says to the counsellor, I'm gonna tell you something, but can you please not tell the youth workers? We, we don't agree. Um, Cause it's just, it's just not feasible when you're working in a, in a team environment, which is very much what, what Ruby's is. You know, ev everyone's contributing a different part of the, um, a part of the program for families. Um, yeah, so requiring consent. We also do um, a bunch of stuff in that one, um, technical term, bunch of stuff, um, that is around helping the parent, um, often, um, sorry, often around helping the parent um, resume their rights and responsibilities. So we do work with a lot of parents who, um, who aren't sure it's probably the best way or they've given up um, certain some of the things that they, they are allowed legally to to um, require of their children um, so um, and I guess in, in a really that what flows down so that the hard bit would be you know the harsh the decision that one end of that spectrum would be they get to decide until they're 16 generally um, where the young person stays at night but the softer side around that is like um, can the young person smoke 
Can they stay up till nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night? Can they go out and see certain people? Can they go out and do certain things? Um, gaming and social media and all that sort of stuff. So for us, and this is the, you know, the 12 to 17 year old spectrum, obviously it varies greatly with that. So when we're doing reunification, when it gets to the point that we're like, yep, we're gonna work on you going home, um, we have a document that's called the family agreement. Um, and that really helps the staff have a conversation with the young person in the family about a bunch of that stuff. So you go through and you go, oh, okay, so, you know, can you smoke? How much can you smoke? Um, and that kind of thing, you know, what, what is bedtime? Obviously that conversation would be really different when there's a 17 year old in the room compared to a 12 year old. Um, but, but as you'd imagine, there's lots of parents that have through conflict and exhaustion and all kinds of things, I think given, given away a lot of that and, and stopped being part of those, those decisions and, and having an influence um, in their children's lives. Similarly, as you'd also be able to imagine, on, on the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of parents who um, would be having too much of a say. And then for us, you know, they're, they're no longer 12, they're more at the 15, 16 year old. And actually it's very developmentally appropriate in our culture for young people to be, you know, making some of their own choices and more of their own choices. So again, it's about helping the family work through some of that stuff and what's appropriate. Um, yeah, and a bit like Larissa said, we certainly do some education around adolescent development um, and what's okay and, and not okay. Um, support informed choice is, um, is, is a really interesting one that took me ages to get my head around. I'll, I'll admit when we were writing this model a year and a half or so ago, um, and the, the, the service manager at the time um, came from the disability world and the mental health world. And he used to always talk about dignity of risk. And he used, he used this phrase all the time, it's dignity of risk, blah, blah, blah. And it took me a while and lots of questions and pestering him to actually break it down and explain it to me. Um, so I'll, I'll explain it. And, and, and what I said was we can't put dignity of risk in there. It just confuses people. I, like it took me ages to work out what the hell you mean. So we came up with the words support informed choice. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll explain it how I understand it. So basically from, where I understand it, we can't make choices for our um, you know, young people or, or the parents or anyone in the program. Clients can do what the hell they like, um, make their own choices in life. But what we can do is make sure they've got all the information available to them before they make the choice. So, um, so if a young person wants to go out and get smashed on the weekend or go and stay with a friend that you know, mum completely disagrees that they should be, or even sometimes, because we're not a mandatory service, leave, leave the house and go God knows where and, and maybe even sleep rough. We can't actually detain the young person and say, no, you can't do that. We're going to, you know, chain you to the house. Um, but what we can do is make sure they've got lots of, you know, all the information and have thought through the consequences, etc. We can make sure they do it in the most safe way possible. Um, you know, have you got phone numbers? Have you got this? Have you got that? Have you thought about this and that? Etc. So that one's a really interesting one um, that some some staff find can find really challenging, um, but but it's a really important one as well. Um, and I think having that as a as a key practice there really helps staff think about the the boundaries of what they're responsible for and and not. Um, um, demonstrate care is another one that we where we played around with the language a bit till we landed on that one. Um, and, it, um, and there's a couple of elements to it, and it really relates to, from Nella's presentation this morning, there was the caring adult at the top of the umbrella. And, and I really liked that because what that immediately made me think of was, was this key practice and um, what we firmly believe in after lots of years of, of doing this work is, um, and again, be something that you guys all have um, experienced in your own, in your own work, is that a, a genuine and caring relationship between a, a, a professional, a, you know, a, a paid staff member, and the client is off so often, if not always, the the vehicle, for want of a better word, of of how change is is created in that person's life. You know, it's a bit about, um, as Larissa was saying, you, know, you have to build build the trust and and establish a relationship before you can explore things and explore change, and work out what's going on. So demonstrate care is the bit when we say to all our staff members, you genuinely have to care about these people. Um, you have to show your genuine self to them. You have to be, um, you know, you have to develop those trustful working relationships. Without that, you know, none of this is going to happen. Um, and yeah, they're not going to 
allow the therapeutic work really that happens um, through counselling, but also in all interactions in the house. Um, yeah, so we sort of bundled that lot together and, and called it safety and reunification. It's very much stuff that happens at all times during the process. Um, and yeah, and the program. Um, wellbeing and healing um, is, I guess, was a, was a group of practices that we, um, and we did, we did lots of, um, we had a couple of, you know, decent arguments slash, you know, advocacy conversations about what was in and what was out um, in terms of the key practices. So there's a few things that, that didn't make the list that, that some staff thought, you know, should always be in there. Um, but these ones we realised were all about the, the atmosphere of the house, really, um, and about the fact that it was about creating a, a therapeutic program as such. Um, and I've had lots of, you know, time in my life where I've reflected on what, what therapeutic means. So it's a, that's a challenge. But here we, um, so we used to have um, in this one house as a therapist. Um, and then we realised that a lot of staff had no clue what we meant by that, um, which was a term we used in a couple of our, our programs that involve a residential component. But create a therapeutic environment at Rooney's is all about the fact that the, the physical environment that you're in actually has makes a difference. So with all of our houses, we work really hard not to put service posters on the walls, not to make it feel like an institution, um, but to make it look like, you know, a, just a nice family home that you'd want to be in. Um, and, you know, one of the most frequent comments when people walk into Ruby's for the first time is, ah, oh, this wasn't what I was expecting. Ah, oh, this is so nice. Um, so, you know, having art and mostly young people's art on the walls, um, you know, making sure the house is always... You know, if, if there is any property damage, and we're pretty lucky we don't get very much, but it's fixed, um, keeping things in good nick and all that kind of stuff. So the, the environment plays a really big, um, a big, big role um, in creating the right space for everything else. Um, live on a budget is one which is really just a reminder, um, not that we have as much money, um, things are a lot tighter than they used to be, um, unfortunately, but um, a reminder that the majority of the clients that we see live on quite a restrictive budget when they're at home. Um, and what's really important is that everything that, that we say, one of those things we say, one of those urban myths, um, isn't in here directly, but is that everything that we do at Ruby's has to be able to be replicated at home. So living on a budget is around like, so at school holidays, in the school holidays when we've got young people with us, you know, during the day and stuff, it can be, really easy for youth workers to say, I'll take you to the movies and that'll kill half the day or I'll do this or I'll do that. Um, but, you know, going to a movie every day or, you know, activities that cost money every day is just really not feasible for most parents. Um, so that's, that's really where that one comes in. It's about, um, and it's also about thinking for lots of our young people, well, not a lot, about 15 to 20%, according to the stats, who'll move into um, living independently when they leave Ruby's. It's about their education and them thinking about real life um, and what that might look like, how they're going to survive on a youth allowance, etc. So trying to do lots of that education. Um, eat healthily, probably fairly self-explanatory, um, but actually is one that over time has, has shifted, like lots of things, has shifted a lot. Um, if you speak to my manager who founded Rooney's um, 30 years ago, she said, she, she used to say, she actually wouldn't agree with this one. She, she believes that we make everything from scratch at Ruby's. So back in, um, back in her day, does that sound rude? <laughs> it's a little while ago now. Um, and, and she also came from a, a background of being a chef. So there was, you know, a different background knowledge that she brought to that one. But she was really um, adamant that, you know, everything had to be made from scratch. Um, it was cheaper, it was healthier, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, so she used to, you know, teach, teach the youth workers to cook from scratch so that they could teach um, young people. After much discussion, um, over many years, um, I have said that we, we don't do that anymore. Um, with, with working, you know, um, families where both parents work, given the fact that pre-made stuff is generally cheaper than, than buying all the ingredients that you know, you know, that you need, etc. these days. So we don't necessarily make everything from scratch. We do now occasionally buy a packet of biscuits, um, almost at the time we buy them rather than making them from scratch, um, etc. Um, but eat, eat healthily is more about Again, it's about education for young people and their families um, based on the fact that we, we do see a lot of young people whose diet is just really quite 
crap. And that has a massive impact on their well-being and how they interact with others and their mood and whether they sleep or not and all those kinds of things. So that one's really linking into um, basic nutritional information is really important, um, basic living skills, etc. Again, one of those things that's often gone a bit south when families are in extreme conflict. Um, value meaningful activity is, I don't know, re reading that, that now, like, that's a terrible expression. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to um, encapsulate a practice in, in a few words. Um, value of meaningful activity basically means for the young person, if you're a client at Ruby's, you have to have a daytime activity. So you have to be doing something. Um, as you can imagine, lots of the young people that we see aren't at school and haven't been at school for a long time. Um, so that might mean that we help them get back to school or we help them find another alternative you know, day program. If you're a bit older um, and school's not the right thing or not something that you want to do, then it's about some other form of training, employment, volunteering. So for me, it's about it's about that pathway, you know, to do and, and doing something because again, such a massive part of conflict um, if a young person's just at home um, a lot of the time and in their bedroom and gaming many of the hours of the day. So that one can be really challenging. Um, but, but one that we, you know, we work with the family on and we're a big part of the support in. Um, the other part of that one, which um, challenges some staff actually, I think quite a bit, is that if a young person's staying at Ruby's, then um, they're not allowed to just, and they're sick, they say they're sick or they feel sick, they're not allowed or they don't have an activity that day because they're on an alternative program or something, um, they're not allowed just to stay in the house and do nothing or sit and watch um, telly or whatever. Um, so with that one, we, you know, we'll, we'll find something for them to do. We'll, we'll find them activity. We'll give them some homework or create them some homework. If they're sick, we'll make sure that they get appropriate medical attention. But then you're in your bed, you know, there's no television. You're actually sick, you're recovering, etc. So that one's a really um, interesting one. But again, about, I think, like so many of these things, it's about reorienting back to some healthier choices and, and patterns. Um, Mark writes of passage. Um, I don't think it's come up today, I'm trying to think back through the day. So um, rites of passage, I probably wouldn't have known what this was before Ruby, so I'll explain it in case anyone doesn't know what, is, what it is. So really, I mean, I guess rites of passage is about the fact that throughout a person's life, there's a number of things that we do that mark our development and our, um, you know, they form our identity. So, you know, graduating from high school might be one, getting your, your driver's licence might be one. Um, all those kinds of things. Um, retiring might be one. Um, so, and during adolescence, there's a lot of these, a lot of, you know, as, as we would all know, lots of developmental things are happening. Life is changing um, rapidly when you're an adolescent. Um, and again, for a lot of the families that we see, sometimes because they've lost their way for want of a better way of doing it, or they haven't had great parenting themselves, but sometimes just because of the amount of, of conflict and and violence or whatever's going on, mental health, ADD, et cetera, they haven't done these things or they don't do these things. Um, so, and they don't celebrate anymore. So for us, we take every opportunity we can at Ruby's to celebrate things. Um, and sometimes that's just about, you know, afternoon tea or saying congratulations um, and, and making, making a fuss over someone because they've achieved something. You went to school for a whole day for the first time in like six months. We are gonna celebrate this and what can we, you know, let's have something special for dinner or, you know, probably buy, not make a cake these days, um, et cetera. Um, and including the family in that as much as possible. Um, we also have a bunch of stuff that we do um, or um, around having celebration when, when a young person leaves the program, whether or not they're going home. Um, when they're going home, then we get the whole family in and we really talk about the work that the family's done, the change that's been created, um, et cetera. We look at symbolic gifts um, and speeches and all these kinds of things to really mark the occasion um, and the hard work. Um, use restorative practice is probably one of the most self-explanatory in there. Um, and that's really around responding therapeutically to incidences and, um, and not, um, not blaming and punishing, um, but rather using, using anything, using incidents that happen in a constructive way as, as a learning mechanism um, for all involved. There's a um, 
uh, we do a, our version of a roundtable conference. I understand that roundtable conferences are, are things that are used in um, youth justice and stuff. We have a bit of a um, roundtable conference that we will do sometimes um, to to get the vic you know after an incident the the victim and the perpetrator, if you will, or the um, you know. Um, the people impacted by the critical incident in a room to acknowledge what's happened, talk about how we can make amends, etc. Um, and the other one that we do sometimes in that um, is around, um, doesn't really have a name, but sometimes we'll bring young people when things aren't going well, we'll bring young people into head office. So um, not in my role now, but as the operational manager, that was kind of the fun one, um, to be honest, because that was when, you know, you hear this story, this young person that's arcing up and not doing the right thing at Ruby's for quite a while. And then we get to the point where they've, you know, the team on site have tried everything that they can. Um, so they're like, so they'll, and, and what they'll do then is actually say, like, well, actually, if you want to continue in the program, you're going to have to come and meet with the manager, you know, in the city. And we make it all very formal and we book a meeting room and all that kind of thing. So it's been a really um, interesting one for people don't get a lot of client contact anymore. Um, sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't go very well, but it can just be that that point of escalation that helps a young person's, person see that their accommodation or their program um, at, at Ruby's is in jeopardy. Um, there's a number of, so that's the, the second category. The third category, working with a family. Um, so responding to initial conversations with care and, and then setting up the program clearly. Um, both of these, we, we made two of these as, as key practices um, and largely as Larissa was focusing in the last um, presentation. For me, because the, the initial conversations are so important um, and so challenging to negotiate and to navigate with parents and young people. Um, we, we say that we're a voluntary program, but I think that young people would often say they weren't voluntary when they, that they come to Ruby's, because often it's parents saying like, we have to do this or, or it's over, you know, you, I'm not giving you any more chances, all that kind of stuff. So um, also similarly, some there are some parents who probably wouldn't feel like it's particularly, um, particularly voluntary. I've certainly spoken to parents in, in my time who want to, you know, give up their child and say, no, I've, I've had enough, you know, where's the sector that will take them? Um, so it, I think, yeah, the way that we talk with parents and with young people right from the very beginning is, is so important. Um, as Larissa was saying, um, you know, very similar to her experiences, we work with a lot of parents initially. It's generally parents that we speak to first and parents that are reaching out for help. Um, and in a number of cases, they're adamant that the young person won't engage with us, wouldn't come to see us, wouldn't come to Rudy's, etc. Um, so under respond to initial conversations with care and setting up the program, clearly we've got a bunch of, I guess, guidelines and, and things that have worked really well um, over the last years around how you can do that in a way that's not um, really scary um, and is going to maximise the chance that, that people engage in the program. Um, Counselling is fairly straightforward, um, but at its, at its minimum, we say to families who are using the accommodation part of Ruby's um, that all members of the family have to engage in counselling once a week. How that looks can be really diff uh, different. I was going to say difficult, probably, probably that as well. Um, but um, again, having the the house is really useful with that. So for the young person, you know, it could be that they're they're actually chatting to the counsellor while they you know, bake a cake or, you know, mucking around with the basketball outside or something like that because, you know, for a lot of young people sitting in a, in a counselling room and having an intensive, you know, conversation about how they're feeling and what's going on with their families, you know, just something they won't engage with. Um, yeah, so that one that one's really important. We, um, and, and making it mandatory, I think, is, is really important too. We have lots of parents sometimes who... Um, yeah, are really keen to opt out of the process or, or don't know that they're as much a part of the process or wouldn't acknowledge. Um, as Larissa was saying, it's lots of the work often is, is with the parents and the change for them. Um, case management and case work, probably fairly straightforward, but are in there because they're really important um, and that we, we look at all aspects of the family life. And, and case work too in there, I'm a big believer that that gets overlooked and we talk about case management a lot in the last... Um, you know, five to ten years, that, that expression's been used a lot. But for me, the, the case work, actually doing the bits with 
um, with the client is really important. And for the youth workers in particular, it's, it's about not undervaluing the stuff that they do. So the teaching them how to make a meal, the helping, learning, you know, learning how to clean the bathroom or do the dishes, um, helping them get up in the morning and get themselves ready for school, all those little things that can be really, um, that's the skill building and stuff, and I think they can get um, undervalued um, when put next to counselling, etc. Um, we also use we, um, key workers that's been really successful in the last um, few years, which is basically pairing a youth worker from the team with each young person. So that case worker um, is, you know, they're in charge of phoning the family when the young person's at home, checking in how things going. They're in charge of making sure that the young person's goals are really clear for their time at um, at Ruby's, they can have goals that aren't about family reunification, they're working on some other stuff, etc. Um, but yeah, has been a really, um, it's a really important part of, of creating change for the young person. Um, family dinners is, um, actually that's an interesting one because it wasn't even around when I was the operational manager um, a few years ago. Um, but the team, all of the teams, were so adamant that this was such an important thing that it that it made it made the cut um, of the key practices. So family dinners is literally when the whole family is invited to dinner at Ruby's, um, and generally we get the young person. So they've been with us for a little while, and it's it's almost a dinner party to use like 1980s language. Um, you know, the young person will prepare the meal, you know, decide what we're going to make, and prepare the meal, and and really act as the host. You know, we, we encourage for as much family contact and communication and time with Ruby's as possible. Um, as family life has got busy over the last 10 years, I've certainly seen that, the ability to do that decrease, unfortunately. Um, but family dinners is, yeah, and um, just this opportunity for the families, a, a big opportunity from what I hear, for the families to have positive interaction, to see the young person almost in, in their element um, and succeeding and, um, you know, cooking a meal and um, yeah and a, a really good opportunity to have a to have positive interaction as well and start changing the story about the young person and, and their abilities um, I lost my place there we are um, community consultation nights um, was the one that I insisted actually stay in there when um, some of the other staff members weren't weren't very sure um, we used to have um, that used to be PAR which is participatory action research um, and again that's one of the ones that I've worked out over time staff have no idea what I'm talking about um, unfortunately and it's taken me a long time to work out what what it is that's non-negotiable from my point of view and I worked out when we were writing this model um, and the, the 40 page document that explains all this and, and goes with it that what was non-negotiable for me from a Ruby's perspective was that we regularly consult family members so both parents um, and young people um, would get asked about their experience of Ruby's, what's working, what's not working. And then we use that feedback to try on new things or, you know, tweak what we're doing. Um, and then we go back and we see, you know, we consult and we ask, how that, how's that going? Um, and we use that to tweak um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's the continuous improvement cycle, really. Um, and it's also about the, the client voice or the consumer voice. So for me, we used to have this thing called PAR nights that I thought everyone knew what that meant. Um, turns out I was really wrong. Um, but when we went to break it down, we went actually, so what I said to the teams is, I don't really care too much how you do it or what you do. So again, some teams have really set ideas of, of ways they like doing it. But from my point of view, it's about bringing everyone together. Um, and so generally speaking, the parents come together and have dinner at Ruby's and there's a whole bunch of elements of, of group work that happens in there. Um, not that it's technically group work, um, but sharing and resource resource um, sharing. And, and the young people generally go out with the youth workers and the siblings. But what's really important from my point of view is that you're asking questions about the service and then you use that within your team to continuously improve something that you're doing. Um, yeah. So we, we changed the name. So hope and the, the feedback is it works a bit better now. They know what, they know what we want um, to have happen now. Um, reflective incident reporting is also, is, is one that um, has developed over time. Actually, this one came from the team really in the last sort of five, six years. So like most organisations, we have this really, I was about to say pretty, it's not, it's the opposite of pretty, boring, bog standard client incident form that we, you know, that we make staff write up when something big happens and the police are called or whatever. Um, and 
I think partly it was our senior prac who realised that was doing doing nothing for staff's development or learning from an incident. Um, so she really worked with staff to have a sort of a a, fa a phased form now, which is um, the reflective incident form, and really it gets staff to go through what happened in the moment, what was happening, what was happening before the moment. Actually, also really important. So the triggers, what happened, you know, and then when you're filling in the form with that little bit of extra time, would you have done anything differently? Um, you know, as well as just having opinions and voicing what the hell you thought was going on, um, etc. And then it has a section where it gets the whole team together to talk about the consequences. So that's done at a team meeting. There's a risk assessment kind of thing to help people who don't often think about risks go, how scary is this or isn't this? Because often then after a critical incident, you've got a team of, of youth workers um, going, we don't want this person to ever come back, we're too scared of them, it's way too, way too risky. Um, but working through that as a team and as a team coming up with the consequences for the young person or, or how we're going to respond in future to the similar to similar um, situations or behaviour. And that's that really important thing where, you know, you, you need every team member to be acting consistently to, to create that change. Um, you know, if you're at home and there's one parent, that's really easy, but when you've basically got youth workers every night, um, yeah, all being on the same page and, and really being on the same page about the fact that the young person um, and the family should still be engaged with the service is a really big one. So that's really turned, um, well, the aim is to turn incidences into learning learning opportunities and chance for the team to come together rather than do, you know, really get divisive, I guess. Supervision and team meetings, pretty pretty self-explanatory, but um, but so important in, in my opinion, um, that if they don't happen, you, you couldn't do it and have a successful, couldn't, what am I trying to say? You couldn't not do them and have a successful um, Ruby's program. With, with supervision, we also have what we call counsellor and coordinator supervision, which is exactly as it sounds. The, the two have supervision with our senior prac together. Um, and that's really important just to talk through how they're working together, how they're deciding things in the house. Um, you know, often when the, that, that combo is new, there's a bit to work through with working styles and assumptions and all kinds of things. Um, and team meetings. So we've got an agenda that we've, you know, honed over 30 years of how we run team meetings. We only get three hours for the whole team to be together in the same place once a fortnight, how do you talk about each client, what you, the strategies that you're using with each client, the clients that might be coming in over the next fortnight, um, et cetera, et cetera, when they're effectively running a house together. There's a lot of information sharing and, and um, talking to be in a team, yeah, a cohesive team environment. I'm very aware that that last bit is probably a huge list in, in lots of ways, um, but I wanted to talk through the different bits and, and pieces that we, that we do. Um, yeah, it's it's been about an hour, um, so I might finish there. But it, yeah, if there's bits that I've missed, um, or yeah, or loopholes, um, yeah, or gaps. Really happy to take questions.